I'd like to do next is welcome Georgina Hill, VP of Growth at Weebly, now part of Square. She's going to talk a little bit about some of her experiences of growth across Weebly and Square and some of these principles in action. So let's welcome Georgina to the stage. Welcome. All right. Um, why don't we kick it off? Why don't you talk a little bit about sort of your professional journey as well as uh, kind of when you joined Weebly and sort of the, the last couple of years? Yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe I'll get started by just telling a little bit more about Weebly just to give that context for yeah. people who are not familiar. Uh, so Weebly got started about uh, 12 years ago and pioneered drag and drop website building. Uh, so really made it possible for people without technical skills to create websites. And today, uh, Weebly focuses on websites and e-commerce. And we're really providing tools for entrepreneurs to take their business from idea to launch to growth. Um, and then, as you mentioned, we're acquired by Square about six months ago. Congrats. So that's been great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we have very similar missions focused on helping entrepreneurs succeed and economic empowerment. And now we're focused on uh, building out the best uh, omnichannel solution for sellers. Um, so my journey to get there, um, I actually was a music major back in the day. Okay. <laughs> um, and it was at a time when creating music on uh, computers was becoming more accessible to people. So I started playing around with computers, learned programming, and actually got started as a software engineer. Um, I worked uh, in entertainment in, uh, for a record company, built out their street team platform. But it was at a time when there were no product managers, so it meant you're kind of figuring out what to build as well as building it. So really became interested in uh, product. Um, spent a lot of my career doing product management, uh, launching new products and growth initiatives for large global media companies. Um, and then a couple of years ago, switched, went in a very different direction and started working with uh, smaller startups. So some of them really early pre-product market fit, so trying to figure that out. And then others um, like Couchsurfing, they had some product market fit, um, but hadn't quite figured out a um, monetization or a growth strategy. Uh, so I learned a lot about a whole bunch of different strategies and techniques there. Um, and then I joined Weebly about two years ago. Um, and actually, when I joined, I was the growth team. Uh, <laughs> so it was very uh, hands-on, and I think it was a bit of an experiment to see if we could get this thing called growth uh, working at the company. Um, so I was basically given you know, a really great team of uh, engineers and just told to go and you know, figure out, see what you can do. Mm -hmm. uh, so obviously, I looked for that low-hanging fruit, those quick wins. Um, an example of that was, uh, Weebly is the subscription business. Uh, we had plans that had a six-month term, one-year term, two-year term. Uh, so we just started offering a one-month term, and actually that gave us the big boost in growth. Um, but I think almost as important as the quick wins was really building out a culture of growth, which I think is really important when you start a growth team in an organization. And definitely when I started, there was I'd say a little bit of resistance uh, to A-B testing and, and I would say growth in general. So really had to think about how we built out this culture. Um, so one of the things we did do was invest in building out a A-B testing infrastructure. So one that the engineers and the analysts felt really confident in, which is super important because no one wants to work on a test when you're not going to be confident in the results. Um, and we spent a lot of time uh, really clarifying our values. That it wasn't about tricking users. It was really about unlocking that value and helping users experience that value. Um, and really clarifying expectations. So spoke to a lot of other companies out there and was like, hey, if you're taking big swings with your tests, what percentage of them are going to succeed? And you got to the benchmark that, hey, you know, about 80% of them won't. And so we used that as a starting point, um, and, but really importantly, kind of reframed what it meant to fail. So for us, a failure wasn't that something wasn't successful as an outcome, but that we didn't learn anything. So we wanted to minimize failures, but learnings were really great. And I think 
Uh, that really helped us get some traction, and we started to run in, run in a lot of tests and was really able to grow out the team from there. So now the team is a combination of uh, growth marketing, product marketing, and uh, growth product. Great. So I'd love to hear more about multiple pieces of that, but why don't we go just a little bit deeper right now on, um, so when you joined uh, Weebly, kind of the Lone Ranger to start with, where was, uh, how, did, how had the product grown to that date, and then what was sort of the evolution of the growth strategy over the last couple of years? Yeah, I mean, I think acquisition overall is really interesting because it's specific to the product, but also that product in a point of time. And so when uh, Weebly originally launched, it had pioneered this new technology and there was a real need for it. People without technical skills wanted to build websites. And so originally actually grew quite a bit through organic and word of mouth. Mm -hmm. um, and then the space became a lot more competitive. And so we had to start to look at other channels, um, and those were primarily uh, paid and SEO. Mm -hmm. um, and I mentioned that we provide tools uh, for entrepreneurs to take their business from idea to launch to growth. And really, by focusing on that journey and not just selling, we were able to kind of carve out a little bit of a different um, place from our competitors that has been fruitful for us. Um, I think another area that we've really focused on a lot, which I think most growth teams do, is you know, really understanding the funnel and where there are points of high sensitivity and leverage, and really doubling down and focusing on those. So where you make a small change and you can see the number swing, it can be positive, it can be negative, but at least you know that it's a pivot point. Um, so we saw a lot of um, growth just by focusing there. And then there were some areas where we'd change a bunch of things and we'd just see nothing. The results were always just yeah. flat. Um, and I think, you know, the hypothesis there, um, and one example, specific example, was our homepage. Um, but our product um, appealed to a whole bunch of these different segments. So we'd make a change and it would appeal to some of those segments, but not to others. And so you'd just get a wash in your results. Yeah. So that's where, to use your framework, you know, the product market channel model one, we were like, we really need to make a bigger change and rethink one of those elements. And our strategy definitely evolved where we started to focus more on e-commerce, um, that kind of segment, and then we did start to see big changes on the homepage. Mm -hmm. um, and then another area that we focus on a lot, obviously, is onboarding. But I think onboarding for um, something like a website or an online store is really non-trivial because if you think about it, there's a lot that has to go into getting a website ready to be published. And you can definitely think of ways that you can kind of simplify that and have the complexity emerge, um, or you can kind of deconstruct that. But at the end of the day, your core product needs to be really simple. And I think it's often the case that as your product evolves, you start to cater a little bit more to the super users, and you, you're not as focused on those new yeah. users. So we really had to shift our focus on that new user again, and that's when we started to, to see more growth as well. Yeah, I mean, we kind of, like at HubSpot during my time there, the, the early days of the product were, uh, we used to call it like um, trying to eat the whole hamburger at once. It was like every single feature in the product, yes. right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, we had really built for sort of the mid-market versus sort of the small business or the very small business. And, um, and so adopting that product was much higher friction. And so, of course, we aligned the model to it and that and evolved into aligning the channel to it, which was the mix of content marketing and inside sales. And now they've sort of evolved of going down that model channel fit spectrum uh, to creating simpler versions of the product so that it would enable things like viral loops and kind of some, some of these other channels that would be more, um, uh, would just be different, right? Um, and sort of layer on those new, new waves of growth. Um, you mentioned that previously, so you, you, the, the evolution was kind of initially word of mouth and then sort of evolved to paid marketing. And I see, maybe talk a little bit about like, how did you make those strategic decisions that those were gonna be your channels? Mm -hmm. um, was there much thought that went into that? And how, how did you decide that? Yeah, I mean, SEO is a great channel because it's organic. And again, um, so we actually have a freemium uh, business model. And uh, if you have a freemium business model, uh, there's some complexities that emerge with that. Um, and for us, um, one of those complexities is that there's actually a pretty long um, time to conversion. 
Um, so you'll have some people who will convert within the first 30 days, but then others 60, 90, one year. And so for paid marketing, you can kind of take a look at the ROI over a long time, and it can look good, but there's some cash flow complexities there. So it kind of lends itself really well to organic channels. So that's why we chose SEO. Um, and I, then for paid, there's some complexities there, but I think if you're thoughtful about it, you can figure it out. And for us, um, as a freemium product, we actually gave away quite a bit of value so that we would have very engaged users who wouldn't necessarily convert, but they would provide value in terms of word of mouth. Um, so when we were thinking about paid, we couldn't do the sort of traditional like growth tactic of you you run a campaign and it's based on engagement objectives and you can figure out the audience that resonates with it more cost effectively than running a campaign mm. based on the goal further down the funnel because just because someone engaged didn't actually mean that they would uh, convert. Mm. Um, so we actually developed a metric, we call it QSUs, it's a qualified sign up and it, it scores people based on their propensity to convert. Okay. So we can then optimize all of our campaigns a lot more efficiently, and we're not just bringing in those people who are gonna be really engaged, but they're not gonna pay us. <laughs> right. So for that paid loop to work, you really need to bring in those customers who are right. actually going to... You need those really fast iteration yes. cycles, otherwise you could spend a ton of money. When <laughs> yeah. Not not good. So, uh, I mean, talk a little bit more about that. So. Uh, it sounds like you wanted to speed up the iteration to get paid marketing working, and so you ended up uh, identifying a leading predictor to paying. What did that analysis look like? Was it um, just some sort of correlation or regression analysis, or what went into that? Yeah, a whole bunch of things, but basically uh, there was a regression analysis. It was kind of a tree analysis as well, um, but basically developed a model that based on kind of actions that happen within the yeah. product, and that the score actually updates over time. Um, we have a very kind of non-linear uh, funnel, so it can be harder because it's not like, oh, someone gets to here, we can feel pretty good. It's kind of like they're going <laughs> all over the yeah, place. Yeah. And so that's why we needed a pretty complex model to be able to score them. Okay. And, um, and of course, Weebly isn't the only company you've worked at. Maybe talk a little bit about some of uh, the acquisition strategies or how they evolved in uh, some of your previous companies as well. Yeah, um, so I've worked at all different companies. I've used very different acquisition strategies. Um, one that I worked at, it was called uh, We Heart It. It was at the time the largest image-based social network for uh, teenage girls. And so when we were working on our uh, growth strategy, we first of all wanted to really understand the dominant behavior of our target users. And as, target, as teenage girls, they were sharing a lot. Um, not super surprising, but then we wanted to see how else we could add value, and what we noticed was a lot of the other platforms that they were using, and at that time it was kind of um, uh, Tumblr and Instagram. Um, when you shared an image, it was often just kind of a, a thumbnail uh, image, and so what we did was we actually allowed our users to share the full image, so what we didn't get was people would see the small thumbnail and they click and come to us to see the big image. Oh, yeah. But we were able to kind of build off the back of Tumblr because what people want to do on Tumblr is embed a big, beautiful image. Mm -hmm. So we allowed them to do that, um, and we had a little credit that um, referred back to us. And so we had a pretty good growth loop going off of the back of Tumblr that was pretty good for us. Yeah. Um, another company that I worked for, it was a fashion brand focused on... Uh, Latin America, and uh, a behavior there for that audience was they were super social. So we decided to build off of uh, Facebook, and we definitely had the benefit of kind of good content and a really social audience, but what we actually did was really study Facebook's algorithm, and we figured out that there was actually a cadence for posting that would really optimize our ability to gain uh, more engaged followers. And so we were actually able to build uh, a following of over 40 million. Um, and at that time, that was larger than brands like Nike. Um, so I think it really is about kind of figuring out what is particular about your product and your audience, yeah. and how do you tap into yeah. that? I love those two examples because they're, they're perfect examples of the law of habit transfer, like figuring out yes. where they have the habit and how you plug into it. And of course, product channel fit, like how do you build into it? I'm interested in the, 
um, in the fashion brand example, kind of figuring out some of those components of the Facebook algorithm, like how, how, how would you approach that if, or how do you approach that when you're evaluating a new channel and trying to figure out you know, how it works? Um, you know, what do you go through? Like, what's the thought process? Yeah, I mean, that one really just came out of doing the tests in a very systematic way. Yeah. So we had a bunch of hypotheses about how that algorithm might work. It's probably changed at this point. Uh, but just ran a lot of systematic tests, and we noticed, hey, here's a pattern, and this leads to more engagement, and really kind of tapping into that. Great. Um, so uh, you talked a little bit about, um, you mentioned previously how, uh, you talked about a couple components about how freemium sort of affects some things on acquisition, primarily trying to figure out some of those leading indicators. Any other thoughts on how freemium sort of impacts how you think about the acquisition strategy for your business? Um, yeah, I mean, you definitely have to think about the ARPU component. Yeah. Um, so when you're tapping into paid, um, unless you're really able to uh, hone in on the right segment of users that's going to convert, it can be really hard to make some of those channels. So kind of like the chart that you showed mm -hmm. with the higher kind of CAC yeah. with paid, yeah. um, it's definitely something that you have to be thoughtful about. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I mentioned in my presentation is that uh, it, you know, competition is increasing in these like increasingly consolidated channels. And certainly a product like Weebly has faced some pretty stiff yes. competition from Shopify to Squarespace, just to name a couple, right? I'm interested in how you have thought about or approached um, your overall growth and acquisition strategy in the face of stiffening competition. Yeah. Um so I think a lot of it comes down to finding your point of leverage or your point of strength. Um, and that can come from different places and it can also really change over time. So for Weebly, after being acquired by Square, that just opened up a lot of opportunities for us. Um, so there are a couple things. Obviously, there's the whole Square user base and so we can cross sell. Um, Square actually has a lot of products as well, really a rich eco ecosystem for sellers. So we can tap into that to increase the ARPU um, of our sellers, which helps things like um, paid marketing. Yeah. Um, and it has a brand that's more strongly associated with selling. So that's great as well, because having a stronger brand does help your ability to acquire through paid. Um, and then also, you know, a lot of Square's business is driven off of payments. Uh, so that gives us the opportunity to really think about a business model um, so that can also help unlock opportunities. Um, another example there is, you know, going back to WeHearted, uh, the company that I was talking about, we actually found that a source of strength for us was really in offering a really safe space uh, for our um, users. So at that time, you know, again, teenage girls using Tumblr, Instagram, they have things like comments, which drive great engagement, but they're also a vehicle for a lot of uh, negativity and bullying. Yeah. So we made a very um, specific decision only to uh, integrate features that enabled positive feedback, and that meant we got a really loyal, passionate audience, um, and that kind of paid dividends in terms of word of mouth and engagement and retention. So I think you really want to figure out what is that point of strength that you can really hone in on and use as leverage. Yeah, so I love the concept of point of strength or point of leverage because I, I feel like one of the biggest mistakes I see in uh, a lot of the startups or early companies that um, I advise or that we see in Reforge is uh, they're just kind of throwing everything at the wall. They're, they're just like, I'm gonna, we're gonna do everything. Uh, and um, and so the, the always the, the message is no, like really have to focus. And so finding that point of strength, I feel like it sounds really easy. It's like, oh, okay, I'm gonna go back and we're just gonna decide what our point of strength is. But I know in practice, it's actually a really difficult thing to decide. So I'm interested in how that conversation or how that decision happened to, it sounds like in Weebly's case, double down on commerce, right? Or in um, We Heart It's case, sort of really double down on like the positive piece of it. Yeah, and I think it, it, it really varies. And in some cases, like the We Harder case, it came out of really understanding our users. So we went really, really deep there to understand their behaviors and why they were interacting with us and how we were different from some of our other platforms. Um, for the kind of Weebly opportunity, obviously, you know, 
being acquired is a big change. So I think that just means you're reassessing all of these factors, and then you can kind of change that frame and be like, okay, this is where our point of leverage is now. Yeah. So um, yeah, we had this, you know, there's uh, actually an HBS case study written about this um, where HubSpot had to go through a very similar thing about three years into the business. They um, ended up doing a whole persona analysis. They ended up with four personas. They, they were called like um, mid-marketing or uh, marketing Mary, which was the mid-market person. Uh, there was like a owner Ali, which was a very small business owner. I think there was one called like Technical Tom, which was like the technical marketer, and maybe one called Enterprise Ernie. I might be making up these names on the spot, mm -hmm. but there was four of those and they kind of roughly fell in there. And it was this very big, long strategic conversation about, well, do we uh, focus on one? Do we focus on more of them? Um, what does that mean for the business? And uh, they recount in this case study uh, that you know, ultimately, it was, there was no perfect data or information to actually make this decision. But what they really decided was that there was a hole in the mid-marketing space, that they saw players in the very small business, they saw players on the enterprise side with Marketo, and that there were you know, millions of mid-market companies, and they were like, you know, that's going to be our point of strength, that's what we're going to do. And that one single decision is probably one of three or four key pivotal points in the, in the case of HubSpot, because it made the product features uh, um, much easier to prioritize. They cut a bunch of acquisition channels. It simplified the sales process, right? Like, and so I think once again, it's like one of these things that sounds simple, but has this massive impact across your entire model, and you know, from product, model, channel, fit yeah, to everything. Absolutely. So, I think what makes it hard is there's no real formula for it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> and, it's one yeah. of these messy discussions. Exactly. So, yeah. But if you get it right, then it pays. Everything the else, yeah. everything falls into place. Um, so what I imagine over time with Weebly paid marketing, you started spending some pretty significant cash and money and in investing in that. And of course, once you start investing a lot of significant cash into acquisition, I feel like a question that always comes up is attribution, because you have to make sure that you're investing that cash in the right place. Yep. Um, I'm interested in how you dealt with attribution over time at, at Weebly, because it is another one of these messy areas that I feel like everybody uh, tackles at some point in their career. Yeah, so we've spent a lot of time thinking about attribution. Um, and originally, we used a third-party solution, but we found that kind of black box approach to be uh, challenging. So then we made the decision to build out our own multi-touch attribution system. So we do use third-party tools to collect the data, um, but we basically all pipe it all into Redshift and then um, work with our analytics and data science teams to build out our own model. Um, but then we also run a lot of incrementality tests, really to get into kind of causation versus correlation. We've also run um, uh, media mix or marketing mix um, models, and they're great because you can add in a lot of other variables as well. So, you know, things as varied as obviously uh, brand spend, but your competitors spend. You can put things like uh, unemployment rates in, so re you really get a sense for what the drivers are for growth. Um, so, I found that just like triangulating onto like what the truth is <laughs> is the way to go. And then, obviously, if you act on your model and you don't really see top line growth, that's an indicator that something's missing or wrong in your model, and you just have to go back and, and tweak it. And then the other thing is your model usually has to change over time as well sure. because the landscape's so dynamic. So sure. yeah, it, it's a lot of work that goes into really understanding attribution. How long was that journey, just out of interest, to get to a point where you felt fairly confident? Um, it was right about nine months, and a lot of that was just the instrumentation because you have to yeah. feel you have to feel good about that. Right, and so I just want to uh, repeat. So it wasn't you know you went with one tool or one model. It was really this exercise of well, let's look at it from multiple angles, right, to understand different perspectives to decide on sort of what the end thing is. Can you just talk a little bit more about why that's important rather than just sort of going with one tool or one model? Yeah, I think it comes down to you just don't really have the perfect data. If you did, then right. you would have perfect right. attribution. And, and because of that, you have to kind of use the data that you have in different ways. And then you really are triangulating on, on truth. 
Yeah. So one of the things that um, uh, Andrew Chen and, and Mercy from uh, formerly of Slack are going to talk about in a little bit is a little bit about growth teams and building a growth team. And you mentioned at the beginning of the discussion that when you started, you were sort of this one person and it was kind of an experiment of, you know, let's see if we can make this quote unquote growth thing work. And I think a lot of companies and products are going through that. Um, can you just talk a little bit in more detail about that journey and what that meant to Weebly to mm. experiment with this growth thing? Yeah. So I think I mentioned that our growth team right now is structured as growth marketing, product marketing, and growth product. And all those functions are really uh, focused on showing value to the customer at the right point in their journey. So it kind of makes sense to pull them together. And something that I have observed is often if you have teams working very much in a silo, they're optimizing and they'll kind of get to a, a local maxima. So it's an improvement, but it's kind of capped. And to get to that global maxima, you really have to have a bunch of teams working together and, and pulling uh, a bunch of levers in coordination. Um, so I can give a very, very basic example of that. Um, you know, at some point, our growth marketing team saw that we were getting some results with a, a yoga-focused audience. Uh, so obviously, we updated our creative, we had a landing page, and so you see some improvements there. But if you really want to maximize that opportunity, it meant, OK, now we need to have yoga templates so that when these customers are setting up their website, they have something that kind of is relevant to them. Yeah. And then when we're uh, getting them uh, to kind of upgrade and we're upselling them, we want to have a package that seems relevant to them. So that's more of a service business, and there's some nuances there. So it really becomes a full funnel effort to drive that growth. Um, and I think the other benefit of these different teams is there's a, there's a real diversity in perspectives that I think is really important in growth because I really like thinking about just this frame. <laughs> and a lot of innovation comes from just adjusting that frame and seeing something different. And I think when you have these different uh, team members with different expertise, it really increases your chances of, of you know, touching on something which is like, hey, that is a really good and different way of um, looking at things. Yeah. So that's kind of why we've structured the team that we have, and it's definitely, you know, it's worked well for us. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes even more important where I feel, in, specifically in acquisition, I feel like so much of acquisition strategy is becoming more technical, more data-driven, right? Even when you consider something like paid, where historically it's often been sort of people sort of pulling the levers in the background, right? Um, you know, the best teams that I see are actually leveraging their own custom technology to drive, yeah. you know, build an advantage, orders of magnitude, efficiency, um, and personalization, right? Um, that has to be done with technology. So get, getting them to work together is important. I mean, I imagine you didn't start there. So were there like sort of key milestones along the way from just you to what it is today? Uh, so in my case, we actually we did start on the growth product side, expanded that team, uh, then started building out the product marketing side. And so then we had kind of the life cycle uh, marketing efforts really lining up with the product, because sometimes there's this disconnect between life cycle and the kind of product experience. So we had those running in sync really well, and then expanded more to the growth marketing side. Um, and you know, then had all of the pieces in the funnel working. And there was no real reason for that. Rather, there were some organizational considerations as well. Yeah, sure. um, that's just the journey that we took. But it's good, I think, to kind of focus on one area, get that working really well, get some wins, and then kind yeah. of expand. If you have the yeah. luxury to do that, that's great. With uh, like 30 seconds left here, for those who are just starting that journey in their organization, any other quick tips you have for them? Uh, in building out a growth team? Yeah. Um, you know, I think delivering results is, is super important. <laughs> and, you know, at the end of the day, that's what you kind of have to do. Growth is a very data-driven organization. And uh, at the end of the day, that means doing. Um, so I think really looking at your processes so yeah. that you can do and act as efficiently as possible will pay off for you. Great. Well, Jordino, we have to wrap here for all of you. Um, I believe an afternoon break is next, and we'll reconvene around four o'clock for Andrew Chen and uh, Mercy Victoria Grace. But Georgina, thank you so much. Let's thank her. Thank you.